What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Critical Overlord here. So this will be a recap for Chucky Season 3, Episode 3. Yeah, Season 3, Episode 3. Jennifer's Body or Dress to Kill. Whichever one of those titles it ends up being. I'll know for certain which one it was by the time it airs. Chucky is about to kill Tiffany. It picks up at the end of Season 2 where chucky was about to kill tiffany in new york so he's about to kill tiffany until the police barge in to arrest her because it seems that what nika was up to when she called tiffany at the end of season two was that she must have called the cops on tiffany tiffany is taken to the back of a cop car and nika watches as they pull off nika spots caroline and chucky running down the street of new york so she chases after them caroline stops when nika catches up and chucky says what's wrong cat got your legs now i want to say that Fiona's legs were shown to me because this episode wasn't finished and she just had like these green socks on. I thought that was funny. Chucky calls for a cab for him and Caroline. During the cab ride, he says he'll lay off Tiffany since she got arrested. So he plans to go after everyone on his people to kill list, which includes Gigi. Chucky kills the cab driver with an umbrella shoved down their throat. And to be honest, it's the most ridiculous kill in the series to me so far. I found it a little cringe, to be honest. Depends on how it comes off when you guys see it when it airs. But when I saw it, it looked a little bit like, ugh. It looked like, it was just cringe. It wasn't even all that like i would say something i would call a, a good kill it was just cringe lexi is shown going live to her audience talking about caroline we see andy at his house but from the pov of a two foot doll of a two foot tall minutes not doll two foot tall minutes we don't know who this is but it's obviously going to be revealed to be chucky this was a really cool tracking shot to help convey that andy isn't isn't safe and that he's so unaware chucky knocks him out with a drug like it was kind of like a callback in a way to when he first knocked him out in the end of child's play with a bat that time though andy wakes up and is tied to a bed like he was in child's play too chucky reveals caroline found andy through the internet chucky tells andy he always he's always slipping away but not this time he stabs him to death but it's revealed to be a dream that chucky is having chucky wakes up and notices his hair is falling out and that he's aging chucky uses voodoo for dummies to help him out and then he does the dembala chant on caroline to try to escape the aging caroline wakes up and tells him this won't work and that he needs to see a doctor we jump to five months later and we see tiffany in prison being visited by lexi tiffany says she's sorry about her mother lexi says she's ecstatic she'll stand trial for murder in texas tiffany says chucky has caroline and that the bell doll was chucky in drag a month later nika pierce is at tiffany's trial exposing her history with tiffany devin lexi and jake speak as well and they mock tiffany's voice chucky is at the hospital being checked out by a doctor and it's quite ridiculous to be honest i couldn't believe this was on my screen chucky is told he's dying due to last season's exorcism and dembala has abandoned him it seems he's at an office that services murderers murderers and evil folks like him who possibly worship dembala or some other entity i didn't really understand it because there were a lot of questions raised by it which i found to be absurd tiffany reveals to those at her trial that she stole jennifer's life but no one of course is going to believe her and they are trying to rule her criminally insane caroline and chucky go to a house in law guidance I think this was the Amityville house so he can kill six people to help fight off the aging process. Next day at Tiffany's trial, Tiffany is found guilty and her sentencing is in October. Nika leaves the courtroom and the kids and Miss Fairchild hug in relief. Chucky goes to the White House because it's evil and due to the fact that millions have died across the world because of the decisions in this building, he needs to kill six people in that place to help reverse his aging process and get back in good graces with Dembala. Chucky says goodbye, goodbye to Caroline and infiltrates the Collins family after their son Joseph dies. Henry finds Chucky in the cemetery and takes him home after the funeral. Tiffany is sentenced to death by lethal injection and taken away. Nika tells Tiffany she's getting what she deserves and tells her Gigi is doing fine and that she plans to watch Tiff, not Gigi, but Nika plans to watch Tiffany die. We end with Chucky sleeping in Henry's bed at the White House. That was episode three. Again, it's either going to be titled Jennifer's Body or Dress to Kill. We'll know once it airs. But you guys can let me know what you think about the episode down in the comment section below. Did you enjoy getting that small tidbit update on Gigi? Did you enjoy the trial? Did you enjoy seeing how Chucky actually managed to start infiltrating the Collins family and what led him to that path? And did you find the hospital stuff to be quite ridiculous and were you as a puzzled by it as i was because i have so many questions the fact that the doctor was talking to him as if a talking doll is normal still i'm trying to understand who are these people i'm certain we'll find out in the second half of the season but let me know what you guys think about this down in the comment section below 
Now, I'm actually going to be teetering off into a review for Killers of the Flower Moon. This is directed by Martin Scorsese, who also co-wrote the screenplay with Eric Roth. It is starring Leonardo DiCaprio. It is starring Robert De Niro, Lily Gladstone, Jesse Plemons, Brendan Fraser, and several others that I just do not have the time to list as of now. So, Killers of the Flower Moon, which I think is arriving on Apple Plus this week. I might be mistaken. Maybe they're just helping distribute it and it's going to theaters for a while. But Killers of the Flower Moon, I would say, is one of the most compelling Western films that I've ever had the pleasure of watching. While it does have a bloated runtime, that bloated runtime is saved by the more than engaging screenplay that is brought to life by the top tier talent that's at, in the mix of it all. Even if the story does drag a bit due to how long the film is. So Killers of the Flower Moon, it is revolving around or set. At the turn of the 20th century, oil brought a fortune to the Osage Nation, who became some of the richest people in the world overnight. The wealth of these Native Americans immediately attracted white interlopers who manipulated, extorted, and stole as much Osage money as they could before resorting to murder. Now, again, while the story might have dragged a bit due to the film's runtime, Martin Scorsese has earned films that can run this long, but that doesn't mean that my attention span will always agree with it. As relevant and as gripping as a story about white devils exploiting, exploiting indigenous people for their resources is, I definitely find myself just checking my watch a lot. This runtime just was weighing on me. So if I wasn't already making it clear, the runtime I would say is its biggest downfall for me, while also simultaneously being its biggest blessing because its runtime allowed me to get a lot of what I love out of filmmaking. It allowed everything to marinate. I was able to get lost in the qualities of every major player of this story. The screenplay is riddled with detestable characters that are well-rounded enough to earn your investment. So obviously, most of them are cruel, sick, twisted, well-dressed individuals, but exploring you is highly compelling and thought provoking a great set of tools that any screenplay should have when you're forcing your audience to follow an unlikable band of characters the way the killers of the flower moon does because otherwise your narrative will just fall flat especially if you don't have the right talent but thankfully this movie does and scorsese masterfully handled that aspect of the story the complexity of the relationship between Ernest and his wife Molly kept me engaged. Ernest seems to genuinely love Molly, but his other loyalties are working against him. And at times, maybe they were trying to make him a little bit too sympathetic, which might be iffy to some viewers. The manipulative relationship between De Niro and DiCaprio, who star as uncle and nephew, was also great. But what else is new when you put two award-winning actors at the center of your film? On the flip side, we have the Osage people who are being preyed upon for their resources, and I'd say most of them were uninteresting characters, but Molly, played by Lily Gladstone, who did a tremendous job, was enough to make our otherwise thin protagonist worth investing in because she's slowly losing a family member as the film progresses and her mental state is naturally declining. She's becoming more and more distraught. She starts off as this very strong, prideful individual, and we're seeing that vulnerability slowly come out of her. And Lily Gladstone, again, did a tremendous job capturing all of those emotions. Just to go over the pacing a little bit more for a second, Killers of the Flower Moon might be long, but nothing truly was dull during this film. I, again, was just so enamored with the fact that I was sitting here watching a movie that was nearly four hours. It does have a coherent story with emotional beats that resonated with me, and that was thanks to the incredible pacing at the center of it all. Scorsese's masterful direction definitely can't go unnoticed either. Every performance from our key players, and mainly De Niro, DiCaprio, and Gladstone, was incredible. The blocking during certain scenes I thought was great, which kept me glued, especially during the film's final act, which has a very tense and emotional trial that plays out. All in all, I would say the cinematography was great. I thought the score was great. The performances, again, very great. I thought The Killers of the Flower Moon was one of the best films that I have seen this year, and I would honestly give it a 9 out of 10. The only thing I would really knock it for is, again, the runtime. You guys can let me know what you think about this down in the comment section below. If you haven't already, of course, make sure you subscribe. Turn on post notifications and there is a video in the description. I will have links on my social media accounts. I am on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can message me there, of course. Let me know any movies, news, or reviews you'd like me to cover in the future. And with all that in mind, guys, I will see you in the next video.